And today I want to be talking about the sermon. Uh, the title is Thanks Living, Learning to a, a Life of Joy, or Learning to Live with Joy, right? And so that's going to be today's message as today is a Thanksgiving Sunday. And so um, I'm going to ask, answer the question, how can we have a life of thanks living? How can we live a life that is filled with gratefulness gratitude and thanks. And the answer will be in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 through 18. So can you open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 through 18? This is going to give the answer for us of how we can live a life of thanks living. This is going to be the reading of God's word. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I want to begin with that first verse in verse 16, where, which, where it says, rejoice always. And I'm sure I shared this with you, but I want to share this with us for those that haven't been with us in our church prior. I want to talk about how we can rejoice always, primarily being able to first differentiate what is joy and what is happiness, right? And then I think I've shared this many different times because the feeling that we get from joy and happiness are similar. There is a raising of spirits, our souls leap, and yet it responds to two different things. Happiness we get when something good happens in our day, or in our life. Maybe you get a promotion. Maybe you get good grades at school. Maybe your friend that has always been deadpan and mean said something nice. It might have been something where you just ate a good meal, right? Or you had a good conversation with, with someone that you love. But happiness is based on circumstance. And the feeling you get, that's what we sometimes call happiness. Then what is joy? Joy, the biblical understanding of joy, is a leap of the heart that happens when we encounter the truth of God. The heart of God and the promises of God. And primarily spoken through the written word or the Bible. Right? And that's why a lot of times people can have joy when they remember a biblical passage. Right? They, they remember something that God told them when they were young. They remember how they came to salvation. For many of us sitting in this room, we have joy when we recount maybe a Bible, like a life passage. Maybe something that uh, our church members or family have told us. Maybe our parents have continued to remind us. But joy is a leap of the heart that happens when we are constantly in interaction with the truth. And so when, right here, when you see Paul talking about us rejoicing always, one thing that you and I come to find is that rejoicing always means that we have a continual perspective a continual shalom and a continual purpose with, because we are constantly reacting with the heart of God. And what the heart of God really means is we're interacting with the fact at every moment that God really wants the best for us. And we understand that, even if it is his way and his timing. Joy comes from a constant reminder that we know that we feel, that we think, all these things encompass, that God wants the best for us. And that is why if you look at the Bible, we are called to have a heart of a what? A child. We're called to have a heart of a child because only then can we see God as our father, as our counselor, our friend, our Lord and Savior. If you look at the biblical account 
of why people sinned, why people turned away from God, why people trust in God, it all is centered around our faith or disbelief in the goodness of God, the heart of God in our life. And if you look at your life and my life, when we are able to have joy, it is because we have a firm sense, feeling, and thought, just holistically, that God is genuinely good in our life. And that is at the center of what it means to rejoice always. To constantly and consistently be in communion with his heart for you. For his heart for you. And when I say that, I think for many of us, it's hard to swallow. Because frankly speaking, we don't have a relationship with God. We don't have a conversation with God. We don't know we are, we've forgotten his heart for us. And so when we hear this, that we are called to rejoice always, remembering his goodness, it just passes by our head, and we sit here with nothing affecting our heart. And that is why when you see rejoice always, it is followed up with the next verse, which is what? Pray without Seizing. Ceaseless prayer. And this is another imperative that seems impossible for us. To pray without stopping? Do we have to shave our heads? Wear these brown little uh, cloaks? Right? And then walk the streets of Seoul in prayer, doing a prayer walk? Or like, do we have to go into this radicalized idea of life? What does it mean to pray ceaselessly? And why is pray without ceasing right after rejoice always? Because only the attitude of learning to pray without ceasing could lead us to rejoicing always. And I'm going to break down what prayer without ceasing looks like. And it starts at the beginning of our day. I'm going to be very practical. Today, I'm going to take a Thanksgiving message and I'm going to peel off the layers because I'm sure many of us have heard, you know, we're we're called to live a life of thanks. Would you all agree? We're all called to be grateful. But today, I want to break down what that practically looks like. And so for us to pray without ceasing... It starts with the moment that we are conscious, right? I mean, we would love to say we pray in our sleep. But the moment you are practically, intentionally, tangibly making decisions is the moment you wake up. And the first tangible practical I want to give you is to follow not only this idea of Jesus, but literally the lifestyle of Jesus. Can I get an amen? If you are called to follow Christ... You are called to follow his life. And you are called to follow his lifestyle. And what does it say about Jesus in the book of Mark, John, uh, what is it, Matthew, right? Luke, all the gospel narratives. It always talks about how from the moment he woke up, at the moment that he woke up, before the sun rises, he will go to a secret place and he will spend time with the Father. Many of us think, and I, I've talked about, I kind of highlighted this, but I want to go deeper. Many of us think that spending time with God in the morning is good, but in a way it's optional. Otherwise, we would always do it. If you want to rejoice always, if you always want to know his heart, you got to start your day meditating on the heart of God. And actually, this is why Satan wants us to start our day frazzled. Isn't it weird how on vacation, you set an alarm, but you wake up before your alarm? And on a final test day or important day, you set an alarm and you wake up a little late. Do you find it interesting how a lot of times, for many of us, our day begins in chaos? 
Because the one thing the evil one, I know we're reading the screw tape letters right now, the one thing that the evil one does not want us to do at the beginning of our day is to wake up remembering Christ and knowing who he is in our life. He wants us and he tempts us to a longer, a later night and a later morning. He throws off our sleep pattern. He does all these things, the evil one, so that we cannot start our day with the Lord. So today, I want to tangibly, practically give us several steps of what it means to pray ceaselessly, starting with the moment that you and I wake up. And here is just some practicum of how I might do it. Everyone is different, but I think the principles stay the same. The first step is that we need to wake up and calibrate ourselves and center ourselves with Christ and not with the chaotic schedule of our day. That the moment we wake up, practically speaking, for me, it might be something of sitting in my bed. And a lot of times I wake up because the kids are crying like crazy, right? Sitting in my bed at least, and luckily for me, Monica takes care of the kids, right? So she kind of, and so I'm able to gather myself and that's, that's actually a blessing I don't take for granted unless like I really want her to sleep so I get the kid, right? But even in those moments, I would sit up in my bed and I will center myself on Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's as simple as, Jesus, I'm disheveled but I start this day with you. And for me personally, I believe that our physical is connected with our spiritual. And how we respond with our bodies and uh, our hands and our feet is really indicative of our hearts. And so for me, what I really try to do is I'm, I usually don't breathe as much as I should. Does anyone have that? Like for me personally, I, I've, I've never been good at breathing, but one thing I really try to do in the morning is to take three deep breaths as we have done in the renewal session. A breathing in, God's heart for me, that God is here for me, that no matter what this day will feel like, God is in control. Like I breathe in these things and I just calibrate my morning with Jesus. And let me tell you, some of us may say, are you sure that that's, you know, that's a blessing? But as someone that has done it, it is life-changing. And you cannot even begin to pray ceaselessly without starting our day with prayer. And that is why we are called from the moment we wake up to not just do the checklist of what we need to do. Not go on our phone. That's the worst thing you can do. But take that moment, whether you stand, sit, or kneel, take that moment to center yourself and your day on Jesus Christ. But the second thing I do is when we wash up. You know, some of our days are really bad. Would you agree? Some of our days end really bad. And yes, it's a biblical principle to not let the sun settle and not go to sleep in anger. Because that anger left undealt with becomes bitterness a lot of times. And yet, many of us, we say and we try, but it is hard. And we wake up in the morning sometimes on the wrong side of bed with the knot in our neck. Right? Sometimes we have a huge headache. I, I, there's many times I wake up with a huge headache. And our day just starts off, even if we started our day with Christ... It starts off really bad. And what we usually do in this moment is we go to wash up. Everyone, or most people, wash up in the morning, right? They wash up in the morning. And many times we look in the mirror. And this is something that I've always tried to do. And I think this is something even, I would say, even secular people really value. Which is to verbally affirm, verbally affirm, at least in a secular world, what you want to become, but in the Christian sense, God's heart for you. 
And it might start in the beginning. If you haven't memorized any Bible passages, it's as simple as Jesus loves me. I remember when I first started doing this in my younger years, um, I really felt like there's something unsettling in my heart that I needed to be reminded of him. And so I would look in the mirror and I did this thing where I said, Jesus loves me. And this is actually a powerful thing. Now what I do is when I wake up in the morning, if there's something that is off, right, then I, pr- I speak against it by verbally proclaiming the truth that God has placed in me in that day, that Jesus loves me, that he got me, that I feel like trash, but I'm not trash. I may have failed the day before, but his faithfulness is as as is true in this morning as the sun rises, right? I say these things verbally and I see a renewing of not only my physicality of brushing teeth, washing your face, doing all those skincare, whatever it may be, but it is the sense of spiritual cleansing and renewal and reminder of what God really wants for you. I think the greatest tragedy is allowing yourself to continue to hear the lies of the evil one, but more than that even, in this case, things that people told you that were flat out mean and flat out wrong. And I think we need to replace the verbiage that we hear from man and we hear and we speak the heart of God. And to be completely frank, right? Spiritual renewal, a spiritual washing doesn't, it's, it's not, you know, like, as you can see, I got this huge pimple on the middle of my face, right? Uh, and th- so it doesn't guarantee a physical cleanliness. But I guarantee you, if you have a morning renewal, a morning spiritual washing and a reminding of truth, as you wash up physically, you also wash up spiritually, and that you look at the reflection that you have, and you know that you're made in the image of God, I promise you that you will reset whatever brokenness and lies and thoughts that you have, and you will start off the day with his heart for you. Church, praying ceaselessly is not just something you throw to the air. Praying ceaselessly has steps, has moments that fill your whole day. And after you do your spiritual washing, what I always tell people is we need to do our QTs in the morning. Unless you've memorized the Bible, you need to read the Bible. And even when you memorize the Bible, you need to recount certain parts of the Bible that you memorized. Would you agree? And so a lot of times after these morning prayers, what we are called to do is to read the Bible in the morning. And I think I shared this with you a few weeks ago. It is imperative for us to live in truth and in power and not in regret and, re- and, and confession later at night to read our Bibles in the morning. And this is actually why I'm very intentional. I haven't done a Bible plan with us at church yet. Because more important than a plan is a heart that seeks to read the word, right? I don't want to just give you a plan and make it kind of like a crutch. Once I know that we are hungry and ready to read together and we want to be of one spirit, then we will have the Bible plans. Then we'll have the Bible plans. But for now, I think the most important thing is not to fake it until we make it, not to pretend like we're holy and this and that, but to really seek holiness and to really seek life and to really seek joy by knowing that it only comes from his heart and his word for you, which is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And so I always recommend or not even recommend, I highly say it is almost impossible to have a good day, a blessed day, until we start our morning with prayer and to strengthen it and to confirm it with the reading of God's word. Because when, once you read the Bible, you know what he's going to do, and your heart is ready, and you've cleansed your soul, and you renewed your soul in the morning, and you've calibrated your day to Jesus, you've renewed your soul in the morning, 
He will give you a phrase, a conviction, and a heart to carry you through the day. Today, this morning, I, 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 st- I woke up at 5 o'clock, and after I did my morning renewal, the phrase God told me as I was meditating on Joshua 1 is that I may be jet-lagged, that I may be physically tired, but I am called to be bold, and I will be relent- like I will have stamina today, and he will carry me through. That was the conviction of God that he gave me in the morning through the reading of my uh, my reading in devotional in the morning. You see, God gives you his heart. He shares his heart with you, but you you cannot listen until you listen and until you read. You cannot know what direction he's taking you to. You cannot know his will if you are not in his word. And prayer without the Bible can just be a lot of our personal desires and thoughts and winsomeness and etc. We need to anchor our prayer that we start in the morning with a confirmation through the reading of God's word. That's why you see many Christians when they talk about how God in their crossroads moved them a certain way. It was a prayer that they had that was confirmed with what? The Bible or by the church. Would you agree? It does not just happen in our minds. It happens when God tangibly shows us his will through his written living word, his spoken word, or even through the body of Christ who are filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot and I cannot rejoice without understanding the heart of God. And let me tell you this. No matter how much I want to turn away and live an easier life, I can't and I don't want to. Because when you experience relationship with God, when you have a genuine connection with God, there is nothing more freeing more peace-inducing, and more convicting than the heart of God for you and me. And that is why we are called to start our morning and centering with Jesus, to renew our hearts of the lies with, uh, and replacing with the truth, and finally, to confirm his heart for us through the reading of God's word. But once we do that, that's our morning. What do we do through the day? How do you pray ceaselessly? It's learning the discipline of lifting our thoughts to God. And what does that look like practically when you think a thought is as simple as saying Jesus at the end of the thought. Like, oh man, this, this, this uh, commute is long, Jesus. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Learning to involve Jesus into your thoughts. And once you do that, it starts to become a conversation. And it is, you've already gone to the quiet place. And 100% Christ on this earth communed fully with the Father. He was so unified with the Father that every miracle, every teaching, every encounter that he had with the people of Israel and the Gentiles, he was communing also at that moment with the Father. Every thought Every motive of Christ was so one with the Father because he was communicating at every moment of every passing day with his Father God. And that is something that we need to learn to start to have, understand, and be present in our thoughts and to not let it be a monologue of thought in our, in our minds or even a dialogue with just the evil one but to learn to lift our thoughts to God and to converse and communicate with our Lord and Savior. That is a spiritual discipline, I believe, that could change your life. Because some of the thoughts that you and I shouldn't have, we we will be kept accountable for. And some of the thoughts that are clearly not ours and lies of the evil one, God would dissipate and make us not even stress over it. 
or the, or the feelings that you gain from just the brokenness of this world, he will give you comfort at that moment, at that time. That you don't have to wait until Sunday, but every single day, you can encounter Christ, you can be emboldened by Christ, and every single day, even that a menial job that you have will be the biggest blessing. Can I get an amen? Isn't that the life you want? A life that is not just good at certain moments of the week, but good every single day? And that's what you can get if you are praying ceaselessly because you start to interact with the greatest being in all the universe. You will be so inspired every single day and you will start to see his fingerprint on your life. You will see his power through your life and you will start to live a meaningful, rich, powerful, day-by-day life. So learning to lift our thoughts to God is so, so important. But finally... The end of the day is the day that we need to reflect upon our day. And and this is why I used to, in all my discipleships, I used to always do journaling, right? Reflection. It is so important to reflect upon our day. And a lot of couples, they reflect by talking to one another. But I think even more important than talking to one another and reflecting upon ourselves, we put our day down, but we always reflect that. As we do, as, as we've learned to do with our prayer and our thoughts, we will reflect our day back to Christ so that we may be reminded at the end of our day that Christ is enough, that he is the center, and no matter what has happened, he is in control. And that I pray that the last moment of your day is not you're so tired, and this is something i got to work on too. You're so tired that you're just, you fall asleep at the TV you fall asleep on your phone, falling on your face, and you wake up kind of, and you move it, and you fall asleep. But we will learn to end our days, end our nights, saying, God, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And to confirm that we started in his love, and we end. This is just my, my tangible practicum of how I do it. Everyone's different. But that we will confess our love for Christ in our last moment of our day. And maybe and hopefully that will show a beautiful ending of our life at the last moment of our life. Praying ceaselessly is powerful. And yet it's also tangible. It's not just something we say, but something that we are called to do. And so I pray that we will learn to pray throughout our days and not just this Sunday. The final thing that we hear, the final encouragement we get in this passage in verse 18, which says, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I believe if we pray ceaselessly and we are in the spirit, then we can give thanks in all circumstance. The question first and foremost might be, why can't people give thankfulness, uh, thanks in all circumstance? And the answer is very simple. Because our circumstance seems bigger to us than God. And may, many of us is maybe because we are so material focused, what I don't have, that I don't have enough, Maybe I lost what I had. Or maybe because, as I said before, the circumstance is bigger than our creator. His gift is bigger than, to us than the giver. And finally, we want results and not relationship. Maybe that is why we do not give thanks always. Because we are not privy to what he has given us, but we're focusing on what we want him to give us. And so I think it is very important to know that without proper perspective, we cannot give thanksgiving. But also, this is a funny thing. Uh, When we learn to give thanksgiving, we gain proper perspective. 
So this kind of goes hand in hand. It's kind of unique because if you are in the spirit, if you are learning to pray ceaselessly, then you will naturally learn to give thanks to the Lord for what he has done, even in that day, even in that moment, even in that hour. And I want to kind of uh, sum what give thanks, uh, the mindset of giving thanks with the old family biblical principle. So this is the principle that I have for myself, hopefully uh, for my wife and my two kids. And I know you, you probably heard me say this first one. Nothing on this earth is ours. Everything is a gift from God. And I say this to my kids all the time. They have this delusion that everything that they get as a gift is theirs in our household. And any moment they're about to throw a tantrum, let's say my two daughters, I have Eden and Ayla, uh, one is four, one is one. When they're fighting over a toy and the one of them say, mine, it's primarily Eden saying, mine. And so she'll tell me, Appa, I don't want her touching my toy. I do a real quick look and I say, Eden, this is not yours. Nothing in this house is yours. At any moment, Appa could take that toy and throw it in the trash can, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> that sounds harsh, I know. That sounds harsh. <laughs> Not that I said it, it sounds harsh. But, but the reality is, when we know that nothing is ours, and that everything is a gift from God, we can start to have a heart of thankfulness. But the second thing, a principle of our family, is God gave us this gift to share. So there's no need to fret when we lose. That everything that God has given us is a gift to give. And so when we lose what we have, it's okay because we were giving it up anyway. And so we can learn to be thankful with what we have. But the third one encompasses all these things. And this is a very biblical, underrated biblical principle that not many people talk about. We need to learn to live with what God gives us daily. If you look at the Bible, what does it say? We, we say the Lord's Prayer every single Sunday. Give us this day our what? Daily bread. When you look at the Israelites that were wandering in the wilderness, what did God give to them in their manna and forms a portion for manna? He gave them enough for what? One day, other than Friday, he will give them Friday, Saturday, right? He gave them enough portion for them to be, what, sustained. And what happened to the Israelites when they start hoarding and storing? It rotted. You see, the perspective of, of, of God in our life is he wants us to have, he gives us enough so that we can give thanks to him for what he has given us daily and to trust in him for the future. That this philosophy of accumulation and hoarding is actually an American dream, a worldly mindset, and it is not biblical. And this is not to say to waste all your money, okay? That's not what we're saying, right? And this is not to say that we, need, we, we shouldn't throw away this idea of being wise stewards. That's not what we're saying. But the, if your focus in your life right now is to accumulate is to hoard and to store for a rainy day, in this fact and mindset is the reason why it is harder for you to enter the needle's eye. Because your hope, your faith, is in your storage, your storehouse, and not in Christ. You see, the reason why we can give thanks is we can look at what God has given to us today. And that means we need to stop looking down 30, 40 years and planning only for that. You know what the greatest tragedy is? You, you work so hard in a job that you hate for 20, 30 years, thinking that you're going to buy all these things and enjoy it once you retire. Let me tell you, when you get to like 50s, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but still, I'm feeling it. My body's like 60 because I played a lot of sports when I was in my 20s, right? When you get into your 50s, no matter what car you drive, you do not look cool. 
Like no matter where you travel, you cannot fully, truly enjoy it. You don't have the stamina. Uh, maybe uh, some of us do, but it's harder and harder. And if your focus is not to spend your days in joy and jubilee of what God has given us this day and the gift of life and the gift of today, but we're just looking at the future and storing and accumulating for the future, and that's what we're living for. Let me tell you, when you reach that point, you cannot even begin or start to enjoy that moment because your mind has been so warped to placing your hope in the future apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus has called us to spend every single day with the moments that he gave us, with the community he has given us, with the life environment he has given us, to thrive, to have joy, to have moments of gratitude, to really be present with the daily blessings that he has given us. Amen, church? And, and so I really encourage us, if you are worried about tomorrow, and I'm not saying that we are not called to prepare for tomorrow. Yes, we should, and we, we're called to. Even the Israelites, right? Uh, the sixth year, they would prepare for the seventh year. And the 49th year, they'll prepare for the 50th, or 48th year, you know, they'll, they'll go on in that juncture. But let us not live a life that is focused on storing and hoarding but really living and using and being who God has called us today with the things he has given us to be a blessing to those around us and even to be blessed ourselves. These three principles, when it comes to mindset in, in our family about thankfulness, keeps us thankful. It reminds us of what God has given us. It reminds us that his grace is sufficient for our failures. And it reminds us to thank God for the eternity and, and uh, the finality that he's prepared for us. So I have a practical application for you and me. One, it's in the morning to give thanks to God for what he has given to us daily and to commit to using. And this is beyond monetary. This is your time and time not only with your hands, but the time in your mind and time in your heart. Committing your relationships in that day, right? Committing whatever you do to use it faithfully and to be reminded in gratefulness of what God has given you. The best way to show gratefulness is to use it well, right? This, this is a blessing. Like when I buy people food, the greatest blessing for me is when I see them enjoying it, right? It's, it's the greatest blessing. And when God gives us a gift, he wants us to use it. He wants us to enjoy it ourselves. And this idea that we're called to like reject all good things, that's, that's not from God. He calls us to reject those things outside of his commands. But he has called us to be grateful and to rejoice in our daily life. And so the morning, I would really ask us to count our blessings and count that day and how he has called us to steward it. And if you have a schedule, look through the schedule and say, okay, this is something I want to commit to today. In the middle of the day, I ask, I don't know when it will be, maybe it'll be after lunch, maybe after a situation that happened at work or even at school. Always learn to give thanks for his grace in all of our failures and to turn from that brokenness of our heart to say, God, thank you. Thank you for being a God of process and not a God of result. A God that sees my heart and that a God that just not, does not see the finiteness and the fickleness of my hands. And finally, at the end of the day, is always giving thanks to the Lord um, for eternity. And not only eternity with Him, but what we are experiencing in our daily life times a billion X of communing with God. 
I always say this to people when they say, uh, when they talk about heaven. The reason why many of us don't want to go to heaven right now and don't want to die, I mean, not, not that anyone should want to die, but the reason why we don't want to go to heaven is we actually don't know the sweetness of relationship with God. Because at that moment, it will feel as if your heart, uh, I'm just, I'm just, this is theory, right? This is just my musings. The moment we pass, the moment our flesh uh, is broken down and we are just of spirit and we are risen again uh, with new bodies and new, uh, and new souls. Our heart will feel as if, you know, what is contained in this body will be wide open. It will be the size of the sea and God will pour endlessly and eternally his love for us in our life. And if you've experienced love before, you haven't experienced love before. Because his love, that is as to the east to the west for you and I, is what he wants to share with you today. And he wants to share with you once this broken life has ended. And once kingdom come and his will be done. So church, I pray that we may rejoice today. Right? Today's a good day. And let us enjoy our meals together. Let us enjoy our conversations together and the life groups. Our family brought some American snacks. I don't know if you guys remember hot fries. Oh, yes, it's so good. Uh, I missed it, right? American snacks, American chips. We brought for your life groups. Uh, This is extra incentive. If you want to maybe go to life group or not, you have to. You have to, you know, it's it's good. (laughs) It's good for the body, I don't know. But let's, let's spend our days. Let's spend today with a heart of perspective, a heart of thankfulness, and a heart that is fully in communion in relationship with God. I'm going to end with this last um, thought that I had. So I was on the plane and I was trying to, um, it, it was crazy because our kids were, going crazy, and Eden actually threw up, and she threw up all of her face and all of her body, and her hair was like, thump. And so I was, I was holding her, and she was, like, it was just like rubbing all of me. I was like, oh, Lord, have mercy, right? And finally, I got back to my seat, and, and this, was after, this was like the sixth hour in the plane, and I finished meditating on my message and all the stuff I had to do for church today. And I remember I, I gave myself like an hour and a half to watch a movie. It was called uh, Amsar. It's a Korean movie about like the Korean um, freedom movement. You know, the people that were Manchuria, uh, they gave their lives up to fight and be resistant, uh, what is it, fighters against the Japanese occupation. And through that, there's one thing that I understood, uh, like I really remembered. I'm, I studied history all my life, and I think we live in a time that lacks perspective. We live in a time that doesn't fear for our life. We live in a time where we think we're invincible, when we are so finite and so fragile. And I just thought about the world that is, understands that it is broken, that hears the gospel and finds hope in it. And starting from next week, we're going to go into a deeper series. It's called Deeper Gospel. Right? We're going to go into a deeper series of the gospel, understanding the parameters and, the, and different parts of the gospel that maybe we haven't tackled. But today I want to really encourage us of the greatest reason we can be thankful. And that is Jesus, he, despite us not deserving anything, gave up his life for us so that we may live. And every morning and every night when I think about my life, this unkram, right, it's real because I have perspective that even if my day is the worst day of whatever it may be, that I am called a child of God, a child of God, and my eternity is secured. And if I put my trust in him today, even if it's the end of the day, 
I can still have a great day because I'm with Christ. And who can stand against us when Christ is for us? Can we close our eyes? Let's spend some time in meditation. And as, as we have the elements on the side, we'll have time for you to commune and encounter Christ through the elements. But let's just spend this time praying through our prayer life. At the, at the core of this, of rejoicing always, is a praying without ceasing in a life that prays and lives and walks in the Spirit. So spend some moments reflecting upon our relationship with God and who He is to us.